Hello, welcome to Tell Us Your English. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, from Caracas, Venezuela. And at this moment, I'm in one of the main halls of the Yellow House, La Casa Maria, the seat of the Foreign Ministry of Venezuela. And I'm honored to receive the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Philip J. Pierre. Be welcome, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to receive you here and to have you here with us. So uh, one of the main questions, I think, uh, today is that two years ago, back in July 2021, when you took office, and then in August of 2021, too, you announced the reestablishment of bilateral relationships with Venezuela. And uh, I think the first question will be how both countries, how your office, your administration has enhanced this desire and has materialized these policies. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank the government of Venezuela and, and, and the president for inviting me to, to Venezuela. St. Lucia has been friends with Venezuela from 1979. We, we received our independence in 1979, and we've been friends from that time, except the brief period in 2020 when there was that sort of disengagement, official disengagement. Since we, we came, we, we, I won elections, uh, my party won elections in July 26, 2021, and immediately we restored full di diplomatic relations with Venezuela. We accepted the, uh, the ambassador to, to our country, and then we began, we continued that friendship that, that had been broken for a, a short while. We, we, we think that Venezuela has been a good friend to us. Venezuela has assisted us in many aspects of our life in, in, in St. Lucia. And we believe we like, the, we like the courage of the people of Venezuela. It is our belief that there ought to be no interference in the external affairs of any country. We think every country and every people has its right to, to, the, to uh, uh, determine their friends, their future, and what policies they want for their people. We think it's a fundamental right for every country to determine its own internal affairs. So St. Lucia has taken a position that we will never, we will never support any intrusion in the internal affairs of any country. And that has been our position. We use the right to have the friends we want, the friends we wish, but we respect each country, respect, we respect the policies of every country, but we, but we reserve the right to be friends with who we want to. Yeah, regarding the topic, uh, two years ago when you made the announcement, um, Venezuela was facing the pandemic. As we know, that took a toll on the economy of the country and Venezuela was under heavy sanctions and we're still under heavy sanctions. So back uh, to this day, today, to, uh, the currently time that you are here uh, paying this official visit to the nation, did you find the same Venezuela? Did you find the same conditions? Uh, how do you appreciate the country? Well, well first of all, in, I've spoken at the, at the United Nations twice, and I've asked that the sanctions against Venezuela be removed. That is our position, that these sanctions are unjust and they should be removed. But, you know, what I, I've seen from my short visit or for my short stay, that the people of Venezuela, of Venezuela seem to be very resilient. I see a vibrancy in the streets. I don't see a people who seem to be mourning. I don't see a people who seem to be, who seem to be worried. I see a vibrancy in the streets. I see movement. And I'm very pleased. As you know, COVID affected us heavily in Zalusha. Um, we were, our, our country was shut down. And then we suffered gravely our tourism industry suffered greatly from COVID because our, our hotels were, were closed and uh, in fact the whole country, our airports were closed, so, so we suffered greatly. But, and I can imagine with sanctions against you how it was in, in COVID, but I, 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 I must really tell you I'm impressed with what I've seen and we look forward to developing that, that relationship between our two, our two countries. Precisely. So, Prime Minister, uh, talking about sanctions and talking about uh, countries under blockade. Cuba uh, today uh, is uh, one of the grim dates for Cuba, one of the saddest dates. 
and in history because, for example, today CARICOM holds the Cuba Day Against Terrorism and Cuba marks uh, the day or the date after the 47 years of the terrorist attack against the plane, the, a civil aircraft of Cubana de Aviación. Yeah, it was coming back from Barbados. So uh, Cuba has seen these sanctions, has seen over 60 years of blockade, and uh, the island is uh, trying to be resilient and trying to recover from that. But under your, your thinking, your opinion, how these sanctions, how the blockade have hindered the possible development of Cuba? Well, again, we've persistently and consistently called for the removal of the blockade against Cuba. This is our position. We think it's unfair, we think it's unjust, and we've called for that, for that blockade to be removed persistently, every time. In fact, this is one, one of the few occasions where both government and opposition in St. Lucia agree. Okay. Yes, the, the opposition has also agreed that the blockade should be removed. The, the opposition, they've agreed to that. And so we, we are consistent in that regard. But in spite of that blockade, blockade the, the government of Cuba has been of tremendous support to the government of St. Lucia, particularly in education. I mean, we, we, we receive scholarships from Cuba every year for doctors, engineers, agriculturists. In fact, if you go to any of our hospitals in St. Lucia today, you'll find that almost every doctor has been trained in Cuba, making a tremendous contribution to the people of St. Lucia. The, the Cubans also run an, an, an eye clinic in St. Lucia where people with eye, eye, eye issues, with cataracts, with glaucoma, get treated. And there was, a, there was a time when hundreds of people left St. Lucia and went to Cuba to get their eyes done, to get, to get the cataracts removed and, and, and get treated for, 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 for various eye diseases. So Cuba has done and is making a tremendous contribution in spite of the blockade. So you could imagine what would happen if there was no blockade. You can imagine if there was one Caribbean, if Cuba, Venezuela, and the, and the countries of CARICOM come, coming together and working together. CARICOM has taken, a, has taken a strong position on the fact that we are friends. We are friends to Cuba. We are friends to Venezuela. This has been a CARICOM position. It's a position which almost every country in CARICOM has taken that position, that we remain friends with Cuba and Venezuela. Um, in fact, we, we say that if our region is, is a zone of peace, and, that, and, and that, that is what we strive for, for our region to be a zone of peace, a region where there is no conflict, where there is no war, where the people of the region who share one common history can work together for the good of humanity and for the good of the people of, of, of the region. We are friends with America. We are, we are neighbors to America, but we do not believe that these sanctions are right or, or that blockade is right, and that's our position which we have maintained. Okay. Uh, and yes, the both governments, the government of Venezuela and the government of Cuba have been thankful of that position and that stance. So um, one of the main events in the geopolitical arena this year was the G77 and China summit that was held in Havana. And as you know, Cuba holds the pro-temporary presidency of that bloc. And uh, how do you consider Cuba has done this year or has developed this year in the, at the head of the bloc and at the head of the global south? Well, first of all, we are very happy that Cuba is, is in in, in, in that has taken that, that position has taken that position in, in, in the union but you know the people of the world have a lot to learn from the resilience of the Cuban people the, the advancement in science the advancement in medicine the, the work that Cuba has done as far as COVID is concerned and you know we, as, as far as the, the COVID vaccine has been concerned has is concerned and we think that Cuba in spite of the sanctions, and that's important, 
how they've been able to de develop their science, their technology, their agriculture. And we think that there's a lot to learn from what's happening in, in, in Cuba. And I'm very happy that Cuba can share these experiences with us in, in the region. Because as you know, Ralph Gonzalez, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is, is, also, is also involved in, in, in CELAC. And so we, and Ralph Gonzalez is in the OECS, which is, which is part of CARICOM, and, and is, is a neighbor to St. Lucia. So we are well involved and entrenched in these progressive movements that seek to benefit the people of, 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 the, of, of Latin America and the Caribbean. You have mentioned uh, several uh, sectors and topics as education, as health, and as science. How uh, the whole Caribbean region, and let's include all the governments you have mentioned, the government of Barbados, the government of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, how the Caribbean is enhancing these sectors and how it's uh, enhancing and bolstering uh, cooperation in these sectors and in these areas. Well, you see, there, there is one elephant in the room, which is climate, climate change. Yes. And the threat of hurricanes and cyclones and floods affect all of us. In fact, that is what I think worries the Prime Ministers the most. The, the, the fear, and it's very difficult to explain to, our, to our, our larger neighbors what happens when there's a hurricane. Our friends in, in uh, Dominica can tell you that they got up one morning and the country was wiped out. It's very possible that in these small islands, because we are very small, St. Lucia is 238 square miles with 185,000 people. Uh, so it's very possible that you get up one morning after a hurricane and your whole country is wiped out. Very, very possible. So we want to work in terms of adaptation to climate change. When I left home yesterday, it was raining. Parts of the country was flooded by simple rain for a few hours. And when we speak in the international fora about climate change, it's difficult for you, for the international world, to perceive what happens to us when there's a hurricane. Very difficult. And because there can be a hurricane in Venezuela and then one part of the country remains unscathed. <laughs> you understand? Because it's a vast country. But, but in our countries, the damage by just a few hours of rain, just a few hours of rain, caused flooding, landslides in all the countries of the OECS. So as far as climate change is concerned, we need to be able to get adaptation to climate change. There are things we can do. And we are asking our larger countries, our, our larger neighbors, to assist us in, in this regard. In, because we, our biggest fear and that, can, that takes me to food security. In times of, of a hurricane, our food security gets affected. A few months ago in, in St. Lucia, there was, a, there was a storm, not even a hurricane, called Brett. And 70% of our banana industry was wiped out. With rain that fell probably for about four hours. So we are very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. And we want to always tell the international world, particularly the international financial institutions that on lend money to us, that our problems are unique because of our smallness and the smallness of our population. So we need special and differential treatment. And, and, and we believe with our neighbors in Sela, with our neighbors in, the, in all the countries that understand our plight, that share the same history, that there should be some, some special, and, special and differential treatment for us in the region. So in terms of climate change, in terms of agriculture, in terms of food security, because we import most of our food and CARICOM has taken a position that we want to, we, we are striving to see if we can import less than 75% of our food. We want, to, we want to be able to produce 25% of our food by the year 20. 25% of our food by the year 2025.
That's what we are striving for. But again, because of our smallness, when we have a hurricane, when we have a flood, we go back. We, we get back. So what we're striving to do is to have new technologies in agriculture so we can, we can, we, we, we can continue to grow, we can continue to produce for our, for our food security in spite of the fact that we have serious, serious issues with, with the weather. Yeah, so uh, it, without a doubt, the climate change and environmental crisis is taking the heaviest toll on the smaller nations Smart. and the island nations and also in the Caribbean, of course, we are a, a spread of islands. We're an archipelago, if you yeah, will see. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. smaller, in fact, small islands. The OEC is very small islands, very small. St. Lucia is the, is the, has the largest population in the OECS. And you have 185,000 people. <laughs> Sometimes it, it, it's, it's laughable. I see you laughing. <laughs> it's a, but it's a country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's and we, we, in spite of our size, we are, a, we are people who believe in respect. We are people who, who, who are hardworking. We have a population who is vibrant, that's vibrant, that's hardworking, and we, we, we've achieved, we've made our mark on, on the world. We have two, no, we have Sir Arthur Lewis, an economist, and Sir Derek Walker, who are two Nobel Prize winners. Yeah? So we've made our mark on, on the world. So, so we continue to make our mark, and we continue to maintain our independence in spite of, of the problems of the world. Yeah, St. Lucia works tall on the defense in the environment and the defense of its own sovereignty. We do, we, we do, we do in particular in terms of our self-respect and our, our, our desire to determine our own future with the help of our friends. That's a good message to the world. So, Prime Minister, uh, regarding this climate change threats that we are facing all in the world, what will be the, the, the proposals or maybe uh, the message of St. Lucia at the COP28, I beg your pardon, 28, to be held in the Arab Emirates? Well, in fact, St. Lucia will be taking a carry composition. Okay. Because we believe is that CARICOM as a whole, as a unit, must be unified in certain aspects. And each country of CARICOM, in spite of the fact that the small islands, Dominica, St. Lucia, Grenada, St. Vincent, Antigua, St. Kitts, will are the ones most, mostly affected. The large islands, Jamaica, Trinidad, in fact, Cuba, also gets affected by hurricanes. Yeah. 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 So we, we think that we 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 will be striving for loss and damage, for to include loss and damage clauses, and we also strive for the fact that the international community pays. There was a promise of a hundred billion dollars. That has never come. In fact, only part of that has come. Yeah, that's one of the main claims in several international uh, fora and gatherings yes. that. The financial promises and the pledges never came never to a came reality. To, right, right, never came. So we say, now listen to me. You are the greatest, you are the cause of the problem. Meet your obligations. So we'll be pushing for the, for the international community to meet its financial obligations that they've made. They've made these obligations before. And we've also been pushing for, for, for loss and damage and for assistance in causing us to depend less on the factors that create the climate change. Yes, so uh, to cope with this imbalance, uh, all the, the island nations are calling for that, to uh, the, the fulfillment of the promises, of the financial promises. Yes, really. But at the same time, uh, we have been talking about South-South cooperation, to, uh, about the Caribbean and Latin American cooperation. But what about Africa's cooperation with the Caribbean and with the Latin America? Let's recall that Africa is playing a key role in the international arena. And right now, in the new geopolitics and in new scenarios, Africa is maybe one of the strongholds for food production. They have lithium there in Zimbabwe. They have found other sources of uh, resources and other uh, ways to thrive and to cope with the new realities. So 
how does Africa could come to play with the Caribbean? We have so many ties, we have so many bonds together, so how could this be possible and how this could be uh, also a way to thrive from the Caribbean? Well, you've heard about the, the, the fact that Africa is part, be a part of the sixth region of the world, the sixth region, Africa, Africa and the Caribbean. Um, but Africa and the Caribbean, our history, in fact, most of our descendants came from Africa as slaves. And they came into the region and they developed, they developed the countries of Europe by the exploitation of slave labor in the Caribbean. Slavery was in the Caribbean and then the, the proceeds of slavery developed the countries of Europe. This is a fact. The, for, the, the forced labor from Africa. This is why we are calling for reparations. <clears throat> we believe that Africa, the, the descendants of African slaves, are the people of the Caribbean now. And it has been proven, and as the Secretary General of the United Nations said recently, you can, there's a direct relationship between slavery, colonialism, and poverty. So we believe that there is need for reparations, that the European countries, the countries that benefited from slavery work, should pay in terms of reparation. We also believe that the ties between Africa and the, and the region through, through the South-South relationship should be developed. And we're very pleased to understand that Kenya is right now wants to play an active part in the restoration of what's happening in Haiti because Haiti is an issue and a problem for all of us. The whole, the whole, the entire region, the entire Caribbean region, including Venezuela and Cuba, we're very concerned about what's happening in Haiti. I mean, Haiti is a country with a rich history. Haiti is the is the is a country of Toussaint Louverture and 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 Henri Christophe, a country with a rich, rich history of struggle, of liberation, of freedom, of independence. And Haiti now is in a state where very soon, if something, is on, if something is not done, Haiti will descend into chaos, the absolute chaos. CARICOM is playing a very important role as far as, that, 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 as, far as Haiti is concerned. And as you heard, I'm sure you heard that Kenya decided there will be, there'll be a direct intervention in Haiti for the sake of peace, peacekeeping troops. The country of Rwanda has also asked to as to assist. We hope that we can, because Rwanda again has a, a history that, that can help us happen in, in Haiti. So, South South, South, South uh, dialogue is extremely important because, as I said before, Africa, African slaves in the region, they stayed there and they created the region and with that wealth, Europe developed. So, we're looking forward to closer cooperation with Africa and closer cooperation with countries of the South. Precisely. So uh, we were talking about uh, all the regional blocks and we were talking about Africa. So there is just one question left. Um, what about the BRICS? What do your administration, your government, St. Lucia, uh, thinks and ponders about uh, BRICS as uh, another way to be united against hegemonism and another way to enhance and to thrive? Well, we have been speaking, we've been speaking a lot about a new world financial order. Most of our countries are highly indebted. And most of that is caused because we've had to rebuild our countries after hurricanes. We've had to borrow at not very discretionary rates from the larger, the IFCs, the larger financial institutions, we have to borrow from them to develop our countries and we have to pay it back. We are calling for a new world financial order. We think that we should, there should be 
death redemption, we think that most that many of the deaths that have, that were caused because of climate disasters should be forgiven. This is what we're calling for. And we're calling for a new form of relationship between our small islands and international financial institutions. And we see the possibility of that happening in arrangement with the BRIC, with the BRIC countries. But as we always maintain, we understand our history and we do not want to antagonize anyone. Our job as a country, as countries in the region, is for a peaceful coexistence in the world so we can benefit our people. What's important to us is improving the quality of life of the people of our country. We need to improve their education. We need to improve their social situation. We need to improve their housing. We need to increase their health facilities. We need to ensure food security. We need a better life for the people of the region and the people of St. in particular. And we're willing to work with anyone who wants to give us that. But we maintain the fact that we need to have a right to determine our own destiny. As a country, as a people, we think it's our own, we, that that's our right. And this is why in the international forum, we say to, to the entire world, St. Lucia is respectful of every country's right to self-determination and self-rule and every country's right to determine the future for the people of the country. This is our solemn promise to the world in that we believe that we have a role to play, but we must be allowed to play that role unhindered. Because our people want to be, our people, we are not medicants. We want to be, we want to have friends, we want to have partners so we can work together. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think this, uh, the, the summarizing of the interview is that we have to thrive together from peace and from a common place and not to antagonize and not to go to war. We thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank President uh, uh, Maduro for inviting me. I look forward to meeting him this afternoon. I should meet him in a while. I want to thank the government and people of Venezuela for their hospitality and I want to pledge the, the support of San Lucia for, the, for Venezuela's right and its claim to exist peacefully. Thank you, Prime Minister. So in this way, we, we put an end to this interview with the Prime Minister of San Lucia, Mr. or His Excellency, His Honorable uh, Philip J. Pierre. So I'm Gladys Quesada from Caracas, Venezuela. Stay with us.